The Nintendo Entertainment System's graphics are tile-based. The graphics you see on screen are built by assembling tiles from pattern tables, and the sprites can be in front of the background tiles or behind them. The NES has various limitations, and two of these limitations are rather charming. For one, the pattern table is made up of two sets of 256 tiles. These tiles are all we have available for a given frame of video. Second, only so many sprites can be placed on a single line of video by the PPU. If the limit is exceeded, the programmer has to deal with shuffling priorities, quickly rotating sprite priority across video output frames and introducing that NES flicker that many of us know so well. But 1987's Mike Tyson's Punch-Out would seem to omit both of these quirks somehow, not only going beyond the tile limitation but also managing to negate the appearance of sprite flicker during a fight. How is this possible? The short answer to our question here comes courtesy of the MMC2 mapper chip contained in the cartridge for Punch-Out. Let's take a moment to look back at a couple of earlier cartridge configurations. Super Mario Bros. has a 32K program ROM and an 8K character ROM. The NES CPU and PPU can address those ROMs directly, and those sizes are the maximum sizes that the system alone can address. If we jump to various places in the game, you can see that the graphics and the pattern table retain the same patterns regardless of our world location. 4K plus 4K equals 8K of total character ROM information we can address. The MMC1 mapper chip allowed the NES to break those barriers, as it served as a go-between to connect the system to larger ROM chips alongside some other features. The mapper can change each of the two 4K banks or an entire 8K when necessary. One example of when this occurs would be when moving from the overworld to a dungeon or vice versa in Blaster Master, or even simply loading the menu by pressing the start button. Gameplay is temporarily suspended as we segue from one area of the game to another. But what if you need more than two banks of character tiles within a single frame of video output to the TV? Enter the MMC2 chip used with Mike Tyson's Punch-Out, which allows that very thing to happen. As a general rule of thumb, programmers wait until a brief period after the frame is output to the TV in order to update graphics. That period is called vertical blank. That said, here is our Punch-Out problem. The breakdown of graphical makeup from top to bottom looks like this. The heads-up display information, health, numbers, and letters, as well as the crowd, are background graphics originating from tiles seen in the second half of the PPU pattern table. And you can kind of make out those crowd graphics and more in our pattern table viewer, aka character viewer. Glass Joe is assembled as a sprite. His graphics originate from the tiles seen in the first half of the pattern table. His red gloves help us pick him out of the mess of tiles in that area, and you can also make out some of Don Flamenco's graphics as he shares the same bank as Joe. Now, Little Mac is assembled using background graphics, originating from tiles seen in the second half of the pattern table. Can you see them here? No, because they aren't there. Yet. The emulator is designed to let us examine the contents of the banks at a moment in time, and that moment is defined by which scan line we are currently drawing to the television. For Punch-Out, this scan line value is very relevant. Punch-Out changes the background graphics the PPU sees in the middle of drawing the frame. Therefore, if we increase the scan line's value here, so that we are examining the banks the PPU sees at a later moment in time during frame output, the crowd graphics disappear and are replaced by the little Mac graphics, Mario, TKO, and the numbers Mario uses for counting. The switch occurs mid-frame around scan line 95. So think of screen makeup once again with a focus on moving from top to bottom. Background graphics are selected from two different banks in a single frame. We never have to worry about a conflict because the HUD and crowd will always be above this line and Little Mac will always be below this line. There is no overlap. The opponent's sprite can mix with either set of background tiles, and a simple matter of priority between background and sprites can allow Joe to be in front of the crowd but behind Little Mac. How the double backgrounds worth of banks are switched is kind of fun. So how would we perform this switch? Do we need to write some code for that? And if we use a CPU instruction to switch character banks, when would you do that if you have to switch between two background banks in the middle of the same frame? Why do I ask this question? Check this out. CPU operations take so many cycles to complete, and the cycle count varies depending on which instructions you are executing. Four cycle operations take more time to execute than three cycle operations. Fairly obvious, right? 
If we use the event viewer as a timeline to illustrate the when of CPU instruction execution during a given frame, when in this process do we have the CPU tell the MMC2 to switch out the background graphics in the pattern table? Well, if these boxes drawn over the game graphics represent the various things the CPU is doing as time is moving forward, we probably want to switch our background pattern bank about here? So maybe write our bank switch code and squeeze it in somewhere around here, at this moment in time, somewhere close to scanline 95, a moment in time we can see thanks to using the graphics as a timeline in a modern emulator. It sounds like a good idea that makes sense, but here's the thing. The CPU does not execute the exact same instructions at the exact same time for every frame. Our hearts sink when we let the game roll. Now where does it go? When, when does it happen? The moment in time for logic execution is inconsistent. We can't rely on a bank switch for the background graphics to always take place when we want during normal code execution because we don't know the when of that code execution for each frame. If you wish to find where in the code the switch takes place, where the bank is actually changed courtesy of the CPU, you will never find it because the switch isn't performed in code. This is the name table, an area of VRAM that holds the tile layout for our background along with our attribute table that contains palette information. This is the pattern table. It contains the various tile patterns the PPU can read for sprites and the background to render video output. In the case of Punch-Out, sprite tiles are in the top half and the background tiles are in the bottom half. Numbers in the name table indicate which tiles from the pattern table the PPU should use to build the background. 76 hex means draw this post, then 77 hex means draw this part of the crowd, then 92 hex means draw this part of the crowd. A simple matter of reading a byte from the name table, retrieving the tiles pattern from the pattern table, and using it to draw the screen. The PPU also follows a set of priority rules to combine the sprite tiles with the background tiles when assembling the output graphics. Now, during a frame, the MMC2 can switch between a pair of 4K banks from the 128K character ROM for the first half of the pattern table, as well as switch between a pair of banks for the second half of the pattern table. Which 4K banks from the character ROM the MMC2 can switch between was selected prior to this frame's output? With banks selected for a possible switch, how does the switch happen? The PPU's reading of specific tile indices from the pattern table, either FD or FE, tells the MMC2 which pattern bank to let the PPU see. It can switch between a pair of banks for sprites, as well as between a pair of banks for backgrounds in Punch-Out. Our video will focus on backgrounds for explaining this operation in detail, so let's omit the sprite set from our illustration just to keep things simple. We'll also arrange these name table bytes in such a way that we can overlay our corresponding tile patterns. While our name table bytes no longer match their exact order in VRAM, it sure makes it easier to illustrate the association between name table bytes and the graphics pattern each tile index references. Index values, pattern. Index values, pattern. Prior to frame output, we told the MMC2 that we want to switch between character bank 0 in the character ROM, the crowd, and character bank 1 in the character ROM, Little Mac idling. Backgrounds require a switch on every row. We draw the graphics to the TV from top to bottom, so these tiles in the name table have a value of FD. When the PPU reads index FD from the pattern table, the MMC2 shows the crowd bank for the pattern table. That's what the PPU sees as it goes about its business retrieving tile patterns to write to the screen. These tiles in the name table have a value of FE. When the PPU reaches this point in the screen and reads index FE from the pattern table, the MMC2 shows the Little Mac idling bank for the pattern table, and the PPU goes about its business. That's it. Read FD from the pattern table, see the crowd bank. Read FE from the pattern table, see the Little Mac idling bank. One big switchover happens right where we want it, and it does not require the CPU or an interrupt. Of course, Little Mac does more than simply idle. If player input is processed and Mac throws a high punch at Joe, the code knows to set Little Mac's pattern selection to character bank 2 for a few frames as he is jumping up, and then bank 3 for a few frames as he is fully extended. With the punch complete, the bank selection reverses, back to bank 2, and then finally a return to bank 1. 
So each frame is drawn using the crowd bank and a little Mac bank, but the code looks up which little Mac bank to use and changes the bank selection between frames in order to animate him. Since the game looks up which character bank to use for the desired Mac pose, and Little Mac uses two frames for his idling shuffle, both of which use character bank one, we can change that bank number from one, Little Mac idling bank, to zero, the crowd bank, using two Game Genie codes. One code for each idling frame for Little Mac. Now the MMC2 switches between bank zero and bank zero as we draw down the screen. FD and FE reads effectively let us continue to see the same bank. Little Mac is now a stack of numbers and letters while idling as his two frames are built using the crowd bank now. Sticking with our crowd and Little Mac idling banks for our example, since all FD and FE tiles are solid blue, let's find a way to differentiate them. How about we draw on them? I'll draw an E on the FE tile for the Little Mac idling set and a D on the FD tile for the crowd set. Now we'll be able to see where those tiles are on the screen when used. The E tiles from bank one can be seen on screen. The solid blue tiles come from index FF. These blue tiles are FF tiles from bank zero, the crowd, and these blue tiles are FF tiles from bank one, Little Max idling graphics. So where are the D tiles? Well, they're off screen. We saw them arranged like this a moment ago, a proper visualization of the name table actually looks like this. We have two screens worth of information side by side. Each row has multiple instances of either FD or FE, and this screen arrangement in the name table is set up for horizontal scrolling, of course. Wait, scrolling in Punch-Out? Let's remain focused on the tile graphics for now. This little corridor of solid blue FF tiles is rather interesting. What is this anyway? This is the area where Mario walks out and counts when a boxer is knocked down. With the grid enabled in the name table viewer, we can watch Mario walk out and see how he is split across the various tiles. Notice that it isn't just a matter of pushing the tiles eight pixels left to snap him into the next location with each step, which would result in a very jerky motion. Mario has a completely different set of tiles for each frame of animation. Take his face for example, it looks the same when assembled with both tile sets, but the pixels used in each tile change. This helps animate the background tiles in a smooth manner. Mario has to snap into different grid positions as he is made up of background tiles. The use of additional tiles were used to overcome jerky animation. As for the fluidity of Little Max movement, it is performed thanks to scrolling. Yes, horizontal scrolling is used to move Little Mac about the screen in a smooth motion. With the letter E drawn inside the other character ROM banks used by Little Mac, the scrolling is much more obvious as we have static blocks floating left and right as he moves around. While it may seem odd at first that only half the screen is scrolling horizontally, it's actually quite normal. Super Mario Bros. and Castlevania each have a status bar at the top of the screen. Those graphics are locked into place, but the gameplay area can scroll. In the same way, this entire chunk of graphics, including the crowd and the ropes, is just like the top of the screen in Super Mario Bros. or Castlevania, just much larger. Scrolling only occurs from here down. As a bit of trivia, Punch-Out! uses a Sprite Zero hit, an important topic in of itself for NES development, in order to know where to split the screen for scrolling. Mario does the same thing. To oversimplify, a flag is set in the hardware when Sprite Zero graphics overlap background graphics. The game continues to check that flag, the Sprite Zero hit, to know when to do scrolling. Super Mario Bros. uses a sprite for part of a coin in the status bar. Scrolling is allowed underneath it. Punch-Out! has a dash sprite just underneath whatever that is on the right side of the screen. Therefore, this area is the status bar and this area is the scrollable field in gameplay. If you'll allow me to break this game even more, I'll relocate Sprite Zero to a place higher on the screen. The crowd scrolls along with Little Mac, and if we dodge to the side, what do you know? There are the FD tiles that we drew the letter D on earlier in our discussion. Two background tile sets per screen plus sprites plus split screen scrolling help create the punch out experience.
Hope you enjoyed this examination of the MMC2 mapper chip functionality in Mike Tyson's punch out along with some scrolling surprises. Please like and subscribe and get the word out for more videos like this one. I also have a Patreon available if you are interested and thanks for watching.